So uh, thank you, everybody, and thank you for the invitation to present here. I'm really excited to talk to you about this work. It'll be evident as the, the talk goes on that I'm a political scientist and not just uh, like some sort of like data cruncher or something. Uh, so I'm actually moving to the University of Chicago now, so I'm, I'm going to be located in the Midwest. Uh, not as nice weather, easier place to buy a house. Um, okay, so if you think about like my work and a lot of other work, like people like me, we're interested in this interesting infusion uh, intersection that's occurring where we have Texas data that's basically taking over the social sciences. And when we think about the way Texas data has taken over the social sciences and really become pervasive, we can think about things like discovery, where people use things like clustering or topic models to come up with some new organization of text. Or we might think about doing things like measurement, where people go out and they try to measure quantities of interest that have been theoretically relevant for a long time but we just really haven't had the capacity to do it. In fact, that's where my work has basically sat uh, for most of my career, in this measurement phase. But what, what's missing from this, and what perhaps is odd, is that social scientists usually aren't interested in just discovery and measurement. If you look at the bulk of papers that happen at social science conferences, what they want to do is they want to make some causal inference. They want to elicit some response so they want to have some intervention and see how people respond, perhaps in text, or they want to have some text-based intervention and they want to elicit some sort of quantitative response. And so it's odd that, that text methods haven't addressed this. And so in this talk today, I want to talk a little bit about making causal inferences with text. In particular, I want to highlight an interesting intersection that can happen, perhaps based on the sort of legacy of where these text to data methods have been, where we're going to incorporate an explicit discovery phase into the estimation of the causal effects. To do this, I'm going to have two running examples, which will like, lay on the table my political science credentials. And so uh, one running example that I have, and in, indeed my substantive work that I'm interested in right now, is how the government responds to people complaining about things. So this is one example of someone complaining about things. He's complaining, you see his fingers pointed. So this is uh, someone who identifies with the Tea Party complaining in 2009 about uh, the Affordable Care Act. Um, we may also think about complaints now happening regularly. So these are a bunch of people who are in the herbal tea party complaining about uh, Donald Trump. Uh, the herbal tea party, it's a joke about left-wing people. Um, it works in the US. Um, OK, but I want to talk about a particular kind of complaint that's made to the government. And these are consumer complaints. If you've ever had to complain about anything as a consumer, this is probably just like a grab from what you look like as you're making those complaints. And in particular, I want to talk about complaints that are made to Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This is an agency that's created as a product of the Dodd-Frank reforms legislation. And what they do is they take complaints from consumers, and they try to use their capacity as a federal agency that can act actually levy fines and extract out uh, concessionary payments from these uh, businesses in order to elicit a response that's, response that's beneficial to the consumer. And so what we're going to be interested in is what facets of a complaint. How can people write about what they're doing? How can they express the things that have been done to them in order to elicit what's going to be called a timely response, which is going to be a big and important factor in what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau does. So that, in one way, is thinking about text as the intervention. People write things down, and it gets some response from an agency. But we can also think about text as a response. Perhaps there's no better example of how text can change the world than Donald Trump every day, driving markets, um, shaping the media's agendas with you know, 130 characters, 30 of which are misspelled. You know, uh, it's, it's a really remarkable thing. So there's, there's, if I were to say to you Donald Trump has an influence on the world through his text, you wouldn't doubt me, but, but more rank and file presidents, presidents uh, before Trump were trying to do this as well. And they would do it through a process called going public. So this is an example of Barack Obama doing this, where they would make some big speech from the Oval Office, and they would try to do either affect public opinion or affect the media's agenda. And so this is an example where you have some intervention, and then you have some text-based response. You're trying to change the way the media are covering the president or what the media are writing about. And so we're going to think about how to, to measure that, that response as well. So here we have two examples where we have text is the intervention, the independent variable, and we have text is the response. And what I want to present to you are two big ideas about why text and causal inference are interesting, or with high dimensional things it's interesting. So the first is that we're almost always interested in some latent representation of the text when we're doing causal inference. That is, we want to come up with some compression of the text, and that's the thing that we're either going to treat as the treatment or the thing we're going to treat as the dependent variable. But as soon as we're doing that, it becomes interesting to know how we're going to find out this thing we're going to call the G function throughout the talk. How is it that we can go about discovering those features and then credibly estimating the effects? 
So we have this idea of compression. And the other sort of big idea that I want to take away from the talk is that we're going to use training and test splits, but for different reasons than normally used in machine learning settings. We're not going to use them in order to get um, credible evaluations of a correct classification rate. We're going to use this in order to avoid a particularly thorny technical issue that I'm going to call an analyst-induced SUTFA violation. And we're going to do this for a, a sociological reason or behavioral reason to try to get people to p-hack less. All right. So let's dive right into this first example where we have uh, the text as the intervention or the treatment. And so we can ask an interesting question, a question that bureaucrats would want to know at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, but political scientists would want to know as well. What is it about consumer complaints that could lead to a timely response from businesses? How is it that people are getting this, this bureau to do what they want it to do? So how might we go about figuring this out? Well, if you've spent time in Silicon Valley or an industry, one way you might try to do this is with an A-B test. Right. So you go walk into Facebook or Google or whatever sort of rank and file startup that's hanging out in your local donut shop in Silicon Valley, and you, they run these sorts of experiments where they have two different complaints. They randomly assign people to read these complaints, bureaucrats read the complaint, they react in some way, and they're able to pick the best complaint out of this, this bundle. And so A-B tests are outstanding, but as a social scientist, they're a little... Um, they come up a little short because we want to know what is it about the complaint. We don't want to know that the whole entity is better. We want to know about the underlying features that make it better. And so we could think about some other way in which we might try to think about how this text could have some sort of effect. And so we may think that we have some big document term matrix representation of the text. And we may think about just the presence or absence of particular terms. Right? And so here I've given an example of this where I've taken this one complaint and instead of uh, having payment appear in this complaint, we're going to strike it out here. So you can imagine this complaint uh, is the same as that complaint, except payment is missing. And so from this, we could credibly estimate, with a sort of procedure, credibly estimate the effect of the word payment on a response. But this is also unsatisfactory as well. Because as social scientists, we're almost never interested in the effect of only one word on a response. Instead, what we're interested in is some underlying feature or representation, some latent aspect of the text and how that elicits a response. So here is a much more common sort of experiment that you're likely to see in the social sciences, where you have a complaint that's been altered in a very particular sort of way. And the way it's been altered is that it, one small component of it's been rewritten. And so here in complaint A, which we may call treatment one, we have the original text where someone's expressing that Wells Fargo really sucks fair, uh, tough but fair, um, and that they're going to avoid doing business with them in the future. So that, that's tough, but you could also imagine that that's off-putting to someone who works at Wells Fargo and, and likes it, if that person exists. And so um, you could rewrite this and have a more sort of uh, uh, forgiving statement at the end, which says, I understand mistakes happen. I hope Wells Fargo can improve their procedures in the future, right? So we can elicit, uh, we could randomly assign these two treatments and elicit some response. Critically, what's going on here, in both of these settings, we're, as the analyst, applying a function to this text. The function that we're applying is we're saying we're taking this big text, and we can map complaint A down to a number, 1, and complaint A prime down to another number, 0. Okay? And we, as the analyst, are doing that. We're saying that's the distillation of this text. So we have this latent representation of the text that we're imposing as the analyst, as the thing that's going to be driving intervention. And it turns out that this is going to be true, whether you hand code it, or whether it's supervised, or whether it's unsupervised. You have this latent representation of the text, sort of a general way to think about what's going on with text-based experiments. But for that sort of experiment to work, you have to assume that you know the interesting treatments in advance. But what's true about a lot of text collections that you might work with is that you discover what the interesting interventions might be or a coding of those texts might be after viewing the data. So you acquire the data, you go to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, acquire the data, do some coding, and then now you understand what the, what the treatments might be. But this then creates this interesting problem for causal inference. How do you think about incorporating that discovery stage within the entire uh, process of the experiment? So what we want to do is we wanted to come up with a methodology that's going to give us an explicit discovery phase while running this experiment. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide a procedure that's going to automatically discover the underlying treatments and then credibly estimate their marginal effects. To do this, there's going to be three key steps. So first, I need to show you that this is possible, that we can have a setting like at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau where people are writing in blocks of text as complaints and that we're actually able to identify the effects of these underlying latent features. 
And then I'm going to provide you with a way to discover those latent features and then provide a method for estimating the marginal effect. So the quantity of interest we're going to go for is a thing called the average marginal component effect. And the idea of an average marginal component effect is that we want to isolate the effect of one particular treatment in a bundle of treatments while we're averaging over the other treatments in that collection. So here's what I have in mind. So just a little bit of notation here. Suppose we have this binary feature vector zi, and this is just going to encode in a particular document the treatments that are present or absent. All right? And so then the average marginal component effect, let's walk through it, it's someone's response to particular component k when it's set equal to 1, when everything else is set to some other set of combination of zeros and 1, z not k, minus their response when k is set equal to 0, and everything else is set to some z not k. We're going to average over those z not k's according to some analyst set distribution m. So these are just weights the analyst decides to attach to everything else. And then averaging over the population response here. So here's two heuristics to think about this if you don't want to follow that equation. One way to think about this is that this is just a conjoint where we're going to discover the treatments, not set them explicitly beforehand. Or another way to think about it is that we're just going to discover the features that are driving response in an A-B test. Okay? So we have this idea, we have this causal effect. Now we want to convince ourselves that we can find it from our text. So how can we do this? So we're supposing that an individual is going to see some text, and then we're going to suppose that we have some function. Remember this distillation, this way to go from that text to the underlying feature vector. Uh, and we're going to call that function g. And again, we're going to think about this zi as just a low dimensional representation of the text x. Okay. So we're going to make some assumptions. These su assumptions are going to be sufficient to identify the effect of these latent treatments, even though we're not explicitly manipulating them. So the first is that at the text level, there's no spillover. Second, we have something like random assignment of text or selection on observables. These are assumptions that are common across causal inference. The next assumption is a little bit more dicey. So here it is. Suppose you have two texts. And these texts are linked in the sense that when pumped through this function, they provide that same binary feature vector. So both texts are composed of the same underlying features, but may have different overall text in them. But they distill down to the same thing. Then we need to assume that when averaging over the population, the response to x is the same as the response to x prime. So this means you could have a difference for any one individual, but on average, they have the same response. So then we have a fourth, and this could be wrong for lots of reasons. So during Q&A, if you want to like get angry at me, let's, let's talk about how this could be wrong because I have a list of about 20 reasons and then like to add to it. Um, okay, so then there's also a final assumption, which is that we're going to be able to break apart these underlying uh, binary uh, latent features. That is, it's not the case that two binary latent features always are on together and off together. You need them to be separated in order to identify their effect. So what we show is that these assumptions are sufficient to identify the effects of these underlying latent treatments, even though, again, the manipulation is happening at the text level. So it's possible to learn about them. Given that it's possible, how are we going to do it? Well, uh, here's a procedure. So first thing you might do is you might assume uh, that texts are as good as randomly assigned individuals, and then we can obtain some responses. In this case, it would be whether or not there was a timely response from businesses after a complaint to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Then what we're going to do is we're going to randomly divide our text into a training and test set, which is something that you've probably all done before, a very common thing. But we're going to do it for a different reason than you're used to. So here's the first reason. We need to avoid this problem called an analyst-induced SUTFA violation. Here's what can go wrong. Recall that I'm going to use these texts in order to discover what this function is, g, that goes from my text down to this underlying representation of the text. So to see how this could be a problem, suppose I have this function g that I've estimated from, from the text, and I've done it on everything. And so I have a particular individual. I'm going to keep his text constant, OK? And the treatment that he has is, is going to be his text piped through that function g. I am now going to re-randomize everyone else and then re-estimate my g function. But if I re-randomize everyone else and include the responses and the text in the estimation of that g function, I obtain a different function that maps from the text to the treatments. The result is that I would change the in inferred treatment that I have for the individual, even though I've not changed that individual's treatment. And even though there's no spillover in the sense that these people are interacting with each other, you've induced that SUTFA violation as the analyst. 
Right? And so this actually turns out to be a, a problem with any instance of this. So if you are hand coding text, you could do the same thing. Uh, if you're doing supervised methods, you could do the same thing, where you end up not having a well-defined uh, potential outcome, which is a problem if you're thinking about like what's the causal quantity of interest you have. So that's the technical reason. I think there's actually a, this like behavioral reason, which is a better reason. So if you do the training and test split, even if you're doing discovery on what the, the function is, you can go crazy as you want in the training set because as long as you lock it down when you go to the test set, you can't be exposing yourself to a risk of p-hacking. And so if we do that, we can limit the risk of false discovery because we're not gonna be going through and re-estimating our intervention or re-estimating our, our treatment um, over and over again until we get uh, stars, which is the risk of p-hacking. So we're gonna do this training and test split. The question is then how are we gonna discover this function well, one thing we want to do is use both uh, the documents and responses. This is going to allow us to focus on those features that are driving uh, the response and while summarizing our text. A reasonable thing to do, you might think, is use uh, topic models or supervised topic models to do this, but there's actually a pretty big problem here. The causal quantities of interest aren't really well defined in a sense uh, that have been in the literature already for these sorts of models. So marginalization is going to be impossible. I'm happy to talk about that more later. And so the result is we have to do something else. So we're going to do something else. We have a, a, an extension of a, a sort of classic model. You cannot be mad at us for the name because we're only responsible for 25% of it. Um, the th Excuse me, the thing we're going to do is called a supervised Indian buffet process, the Indian buffet process being the famous thing. All right, so this is the graph of that model. So here's the idea. We're going to have our text and our responses, and they're going to be linked by these underlying features. And so what we're going to suppose is that these features are going to have to explain both the text and the response. And so the features that we discover are going to do, try to do a good job of doing both of these things, summarizing the documents as uh, distilled in the document term matrix and summarizing the responses um, as characterized as a regression of that response on these underlying latent features. So we can estimate these with this procedure. So in the training set, we apply the supervised Indian buffet process to the documents and responses. We make a final model selection using a variety of model fit criteria. So of course the Indian buffet process is non-parametric, but that non-parametric process has nothing to do with what we're using it for, right? It's estimating the number of features for something entirely different. Um, it's also, uh, we're gonna make a feature selection based on quantitative fit and some qualitative assessments as well. So in the test set, we're gonna then use this lockdown model to infer the treatment and measure the effect. Um, uh, when doing this, uh, we're going to infer the underlying treatments without conditioning on the test set responses, because otherwise we'd have this pathological thing where you'd have different inferred treatments depending upon how people responded, which would be bad for estimating causal effects. But once you've estimated these underlying effects, you're just in a normal world where you can just estimate the effects like as if anything else. Um, so in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a regression with a bootstrap procedure to estimate uncertainty, both from inferring the treatments and then from the estimation effect. All right, so let's turn to this example with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, so what happens is that consumers law complaints about financial products. So here's another example of what this might look like. They complain that people are harsh and not listening to questions and that they're aggressive. So this is one thing that people may ask the CFPB to deal with. Um, and the data are great because they provide a nice um, cleaned up version of the text that people write about their complaints. Uh, and we're also in a situation here that even though these aren't randomized, we have plausible selection on observables, the bureaucrats at this, this agency don't have a ton of extra data about the people who are filing these complaints. So the data set we're going to use has over 113,000 total complaints. We're going to train or discover the features on 10% of the data, and then we're going to test on 90% of the data. And so what do we find? Well, we find that the CFBP is particularly good at eliciting a timely response in two cases. I think the most interesting of which is when people provide a lot of detailed information, which is what this feature seems to be, the CFBP is able to go out and get the business to respond very quickly. The CFBP does a really bad job in instances where people want to modify payments, right? So, uh, Companies are generally unresponsive when, when uh, people complain about having to make particular payments or they want loan modifications. They tend not to get a good response from the, uh, from the agency. And so you may think that this is a bad thing or that the CFBP is like failing in one of the cases where it could do the most good work, which is getting people sort of off the hook on their loan repayments. I would just say that this is on the margin. In general, the agency does a pretty good job and these may be the toughest cases as well.
So there's lots of other applications of this technology. So we've used it on biographies to understand how people like underlying features of congressional candidates. We've also used it on campaign state, uh, statements. People are using it on determinants of sentencing, sentencing decisions, um, when and how government censors movies and uh, even like preferred propaganda in authoritarian regimes. And so we'll have some code available for this, for this soon. So I was gonna have some extra stuff, but I think I'm out of time. And so I'm just gonna go to my conclusion very quickly. I have two minutes, yeah. I'll go to the conclusion. Um, okay, so um, that was really great stuff on presidents going public. Um, okay, so what are the sort of big takeaways from this or the things that I would, I would like the audience to get? So one is a sort of big conceptual idea about what social science research should look like, and that is really a sequential approach to it. And so this stands in contrast to a current movement in political science and eco economics, which is to make pre-analysis plans to analyze experiments, where the idea is that you know everything that you want to do with your data before you get it, write those rules down, and only follow those rules when you get the data. I think, uh, to, to put a fine point on it, this has been a failed enterprise. And the failure of this enterprise is evident if you go read any pre-analysis plan, which I challenge you to do. Um, uh, it is clear that this is not binding people, which I think is a key difference between the, uh, regulation and incentives. So pre-analysis plans are a regulation that doesn't change incentives. If instead we adopted a sequential approach where people had to replicate their own work, then you've changed the incentives for people to be transparent and not p-hack. And then the sort of trained test split that I described here actually is helpful to you in the sense that it's going to allow you to figure out if other people can replicate your work as well. So that, that's proselytizing or evangelizing or, or you know, something editorializing maybe. Um, what else did, has this work done? So uh, in, in work that we're doing now, we're coming up with ways to test the assumptions and, and coming up with new causal quantities of interest to think about using uh, things like LDA and supervised LDA. Uh, and this framework is really general, and not just general in the sense that we think it incorporates um, uh, all experiments in sort of causal interventions with text. We think it also work with things like images and uh, roll call voting records. And finally, there's a bunch of ways in which this can be applied. So this talk has been about Texas treatment, and this work is also about Texas outcome, but we think this sort of causal modeling of discussions where you have text as treatment and outcome and thinking about how those functions that would distill those texts down could be related is a really important next step. So thank you for your time. Looking forward to your questions.